What up, meatheads? Welcome to the Meat Block. This is our Christmas episode. This episode, we're going to be talking about different dishes found all over the world, and Ryan and David are going to have pieces about that later. I am going to just give you a brief history of the holiday from more of a secular standpoint, not from a Christian standpoint. This is Xmas, not Christmas. Enjoy. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. The Christmas tree. It's a very recognizable image. It has a meme. It is almost synonymous with pine trees. When we see that perfectly shaped pine, Douglas fir, or noble, any time of year, we immediately think of Christmas, even if it's just out in the woods or on a pitcher. The Christmas tree is actually just a new tradition, only taking root in the last 150 years. Christmas trees, candy cans, even Santa Claus feel like they've been around forever, although they are surprisingly recent. So please join us as we talk about a pagan holiday that started in Rome and how this season has become much to do with shopping as it has to do with Christ. It's a story everyone knows. After a rude refusal by a local innkeeper, Mary and Joseph bedded down in a local barn in Bethlehem. The next day, Mary gave birth to a son the Son of God. And those are the origins of Christmas. Hope you enjoyed the show. Actually, years before Christ walked the earth, early Europeans were celebrating light and birth in the darkest days of winter. In the Norse country, around December 21st was the winter solstice known as Yule. Sons and fathers would grab the biggest piece of wood or tree and drag it to their home or community and burn it to help them stay alive during the darkest, longest, coldest night of the year. As the Yule log burned, they said each spark represented a pig or a calf that was going to be born in the spring. And they knew if they survived the longest night and coldest night, they were going to have a successful year. Also dragged inside was evergreens. Evergreens were the only plant that can make it through the dark winter. They viewed the evergreen as hope, showing if this plant can make it through the darkest times, so can they. There's a natural attraction to something that could survive such a harsh environment. As long as the Yule log burned, it was a time of celebration and revelry. It was the only time of year where meat was abundant, because they just harvested their livestock knowing they could not survive the winter. These celebrations and Yule log burnings averaged about 12 days, and during this time, it was a great feast and a time to party. The only animals kept alive was the breeding stock. The party raged inside, in defiance, a big middle finger to winter. There is a certain kind of lore around the Yuletide celebration. Inside with the Norse mythology, you are warm, you are protected. Outside is dark, there are spirits. The earth is trying to kill you. In Germany, they were fearful of Odin. He decided who would prosper and who would perish in the next coming year. Later, 
this would manifest into another knight riding mythical man known as Santa Claus. A thousand miles to the south, the winters weren't as harsh in ancient Rome. But about a month before the solstice, they started celebrating an event called Saturnalia. This was a this was a month-long celebration, an orgy, showing respect to the god Saturn, which translates to the god of plenty. Saturnalia was described as a time out of time by many historians, where roles would reverse. It was times for masters to become the slave, and slaves to become a master, during this hedonistic holiday celebration. While the lower classes were celebrating Saturnalia, upper-class Romans celebrated Mithra, the god of the sun. At that time in that part of the world, December 25th, was the birthday of Mithra. It was also the winter solstice. Mithra was said to be born from a rock, and shepherds flocked to worship the newborn sun god. Many correlations from these early accounts represent a new religion that was coming of age around the same time in the Roman Empire. At first, Christians didn't celebrate the birth of Christ. His resurrection was the quintessential fact of their religion. Around the time of the 4th century, his birth had undecidedly become a focal point of their religion. The fact of his birth was no longer in question, but when it was, was still up for debate. Some historians believe Jesus was most likely born in the spring. One example of this is that shepherds were out in the fields during the account. Most shepherds in that time of year in that part of the world would most likely not be out hending to a herd if it was in the dead of winter. The celebration of Mithra happening on December 25th was a huge celebration in the region, and it made sense for Christians back then to celebrate the birth of the Christ child at the same time. And it was declared in Christianity that December 25th would be marked as the feast day of the Nativity. The celebration of Mithra's birthday was more of a celebration of fertility and celebrating anew. When celebrating a new religion and the birth of a new son of God made sense to the Christians at the time. The church, knowing that they couldn't outlaw the pagan celebration, adopted some of it. The trees now brought inside were decorated with apples and other things representing life. Christmas evolved into a decadent holiday in Europe with hedonistic acts that may be unspeakable in some households. During the debauchery, a peasant or a small poor boy was usually chosen by the party to represent them in what he would be called the Lord of Unrule. Many religious groups outlawed Christmas outright. Oliver Cromwell, leading the Puritans, overruled the king's forces in 1645 and outlawed Christmas. The Puritans are sure a fun group of people. In their quest to rid England of all that was decadent, on December 25th, they made churches stay closed and merchants stay open. This did not stop the celebration. It just made it go underground. If Christmas pie was to be outlawed, then a new pie called mince pie became popular. What the Puritans could not fight or outlaw was the need for Christmas, the need for a celebration during the dark times of the year, the need to look forward to the light. The reason the monarchy was restored in the 17th century was because England's citizens 
or English citizens, could live without the monarchy, but they could not live without Christmas. Reinstating them would bring back the holiday and banish the laws of the Puritans. The fight for Christmas may have been lost in England, but the Puritans had new hopes for the colonies in America. But little did they know that these Puritans heading over in 1620 would result in America's second best celebrated holiday. So, epic fail. Some colonists embraced the celebration, such as Captain John Smith, leader of the Jamestown party, recorded that their first Christmas was a success with waterfowl, oysters, and making its first appearance in Christmas is eggnog. Nog is the word for grog, which is any drink made from rum. So if your eggnog doesn't have rum in it, then you're doing it wrong. Flash forward to America's independence, where most things Europe or European fell out of favor. This included Christmas, where for about 65 years, Congress would sit in session during what is now known as the holiday. As the 19th century dawned, Christmas would be one holiday that would help pull the nation together. It wouldn't be the Carnival Christmas of Old England, and it also wouldn't be particularly religious. And America did what we'd do best. We took something people already started doing and made it better, and then said, this is how you do it, world, and everyone followed. In the 1820s, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, there became a class divide in America and parts of Europe, where the lower class would celebrate the dark times of winter and the celebration of Christmas by rioting against the upper class. As a result of this, popular writers at the time, such as Charles Dickens, with Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Washington Irving's Grace Brook Hall, both these stories showed how people, regardless of class and wealth, should come together in celebration in a time to reflect on the year that has happened and the year to come and what we are thankful for. And by solving the problem, what do we owe to the people in our lives? What do we owe to our family and our fellow man? We owe them decency and respect. And both of these convergent stories helped the Victorian people think about their own conversion, to think about how they could be helpful. As a result of these popular tales, 19th century Americans were discovering Christmas after a 200-year drought of Puritan rule. Around the 1830s, family dynamics changed where before then families were essentially little factories to make workers to help on the farm or start working as soon as they could to help provide for the family. Around this time, it shifted to more of a communal, where parents were giving nurture and love to their children. And the popularity of Christmas allowed this. It allowed you to spoil your children once a year, without overly doing it. And being a father, I could say that the gifts I give my son, I'm really giving to myself. Seeing him light up, seeing his response, and then my selfishness of giving him things that I would like to play with is really what I enjoy about the holiday. Victorians knew why they were celebrating Christmas, but they really didn't know how to do it. Some of the pagan revelry would not really suit this modern society, but some aspects did, such as the Christmas tree. In 1848, the London News published a drawing of the royal family gathered around a Christmas tree. This made its way to America. As a result of this, this allowed people to say, 
Why do we have a Christmas tree? Well, this is the way we did it in Europe. This is the way we did it in Germany. This is the way we did it in England. When in fact, the tradition in America isn't that old. As time grew on, the old traditions of the Machiavellian decadent Christmas fell to the wayside. Except for one, mistletoe. It was improper for a man to kiss a woman in Victorian era if they weren't married, but this plant allowed it. Mistletoe is a small shrub parasite, which is also an evergreen that can be found on over a hundred different types of plants. It latches on to a host tree and takes advantage of it, just like many of the people that use mistletoe to be creepy. I myself have never had to rely on a plant to help me with the women, although my mistletoe belt buckle doesn't hurt. By the later half of the 19th century, Christmas took over America, but the only place it couldn't be found was inside the Protestant church. As a result of this, Victorian-era Americans were looking for a way to recognize it in a religious sense. Their faith started wandering. They wanted to see how the Catholics were observing this holiday, in some cases, those crazy Episcopalians. The Protestant church and Baptist church were fearful of this, of losing members. As a result, Latter-day Puritan and churches started recognizing December 25th as a holiday. Now that we had the Christmas tree, mistletoe, and the church recognizing it, the only thing Christmas was missing was a voyeuristic, fat, jolly man to spy on our children and sneak into our houses once a year. America is great at taking other cultures and making it uniquely our own. We took the Christmas tree from Germany, the Christmas card from England, but Santa Claus, as we know him today, was created by America and Coca-Cola. Now, Old St. Nick is referred to as St. Nicholas, an old Greek Orthodox bishop who became popular in the Middle Ages. On December 6th, good children awoke with gifts from the kind saint, while bad children sulked with nothing. In Holland, he was referred to as Sinterklaas, and when the Dutch came to America, tales of their version of St. Nicholas came with them. He would leave treats and presents in their shoes that they left outside. These stories caught the imagination of Clement Clark Moore, a writer and a poet and Episcopal minister in New York City. Moore wrote a poem about the good-hearted saint where he comes down your chimney on Christmas Eve and leaves toys for good little girls and boys. The wooden shoes were changed to stockings, and they were hung by the fire with care. And that poem, of course, is, "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse." This poem also gave us the names of all the reindeer, as well as the iconic image of Santa going down the chimney. One interesting fact about Moore in his poem is the fact that he was a minister, and the poem has no reference to God or Jesus. As a result of this, Moore was embarrassed by his work and tried to keep it a secret, and also published it under a pseudonym. Moore later admitted to writing the poem and taking the credit, after it swept the nation and it was clear that every child in America was staying up late and scanning the horizon for the midnight visitor. But they didn't know what they were looking for. At this point, it was unclear what Santa Claus or Saint Nick looked like. In many variations of stories, he came in all shapes and sizes, was an elf or a gnome. And in one story, he was a fat alcoholic who rode a sleigh driven by turkeys. I wish that is the version we had today. And maybe that is the version I'm going to tell to my children. You better watch out. You better not cry. Or a fat, obese alcoholic will tell you why.
Then the chorus will go something with sequence of gobbles, drunken cartoon belches and hiccups, and slurring of some kind. Feel free to write the song and record it and uh, uh, give it to me. But the Santa we know today, image, is taken straight from the robber barons, a wealthy upper class bearded gentleman who is a captain of industry, but in reverse. But Santa rewarded people regardless of their achievements, especially children. Instead of gathering wealth, he gets rid of wealth, and he does it yearly. Maybe that's why Santa is wearing red. But he was a gift to retailers. Here is a man that can make you buy anything at Christmas and make it feel like you weren't buying gifts at all. Because Christmas presents don't exist in the marketplace. They exist in pure domestic affection. Santa's image alone could boost sales. But what about if Santa was there at the department store for you? And your parents took you there. And you get to tell Santa what you want. Then your parents get to hear what you want. And by some remarkable coincidence, your parents are at a place that may have that very item. The store Santa has been around since the mid-1800s. So it makes sense to have America's national saint. Copied and pasted and recreated across America. Giving old bikers a job once a year. The image of Santa that we have, and everyone has, I imagine, was created by author Gene Shepard, the writer of A Christmas Story. His story was autobiographical and depicted his account of growing up in the Midwest and dealing with anxiety and the eagerness and the wanting to meet Santa Claus. And like Ralphie's little brother, every time I take my son to meet a stranger with a beard, he cries and I get an amazing picture of it. How about a nice football? Santa obviously needed a sidekick, and a copywriter at the Montgomery Ward department store came up with a promotional children's story that gave him such the sidekick. It was a story about an ostracized reindeer with a shiny red nose that even in the original story, Santa is kind of a dick to. I always think it's weird that it was one foggy Christmas night. If you think about every Christmas, there is most likely fog somewhere in the world, and as long as Santa has been doing this, he may have needed to find a solution before he met Rudolph. Now, trying to find logic and sense in a children's story is not why I'm here. And that pretty much brings us to the modern era. From Montgomery Ward to Washington Irving, Christmas was fought and won by children. Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer had a very shiny nose and if you ever saw it you would even say it glows All of the other reindeer used to laugh and This next piece is by Ryan. He's going to talk about what they eat on the holidays in other parts of the world. What meat cuts are most valuable? I like to try to deconstruct my own assumptions about what is valuable. Unconsciously, we all assign value to everything in our world, with higher value items being elevated as more worthy of our time and lower value items being minimized as less worthy. This is human nature to do this kind of prioritizing and time management. In my home life, I arrive upon a set of ideas about where my time and energy is best spent, and I organize my efforts to maximize these high-value activities. Sometimes the value I give things is grounded in wisdom and years of conscious forethought. Other times, I unconsciously assign a value that I learned, 
a value I learned from peers or family or culture. When I finally am able to awaken to some of these deeper unconscious assumptions I'm making reflexively, it's nice to bring them into the light, to explore them with fresh eyes, roll them around in my head to determine anew if I was assigning a useful value to them or not. In the meat world, there is much value assigning. Creating systems tell us about marbling, things like heritage breed labeling, tells us about some of the genetics involved. The realities of supply and demand grease the machinery that determine which parts of these animals are valuable and why. Every label, every grade, every advertisement is in place to not only give us information, but also to influence our ideas about quality. An impression of quality will determine the value we assign to it. When it comes to eating and cooking beef, first, I learned that tenderloin was the best cut, filet mignon. Then I learned that real butchers prefer ribeye and hate tenderloin. I learned that from starting to hang out in butcher shops. Then I learned about craft butchery cuts, seam butchery cuts, European cuts. And I began to prefer prefer things like the oyster steak and Denver steaks, etc. Then I discovered the flavor possible from braising and slow cooking, which turned everything on its head for me. Everyone has their own journey with favorite beef cuts, Currently, I have arrived at a very egalitarian perspective that aims to see all cuts as equally capable of resulting in an outstanding eating experience. There is no lesser cut. Even the lowliest seeming cuts are capable of true magnificence. When seen through this lens, every cut presents a riddle, and the focus becomes finding the correct culinary preparation to reveal the true magnificence of that cut. All right, Ryan, that sounds great and all, but come on, buddy. What about the shitty cuts? Cuts like eye around or mock tender. There's clearly no hope for those cuts. Eye of round, I am glad you asked. Fortunately, humans are brilliant. In South America, butcher shops hoard the eye of round in preparation for the holidays in the same way that American butcher shops hoard rib roasts. Huh? Yes, you heard me correctly. Eye of round, called paqueto, has a very high value. It is more in demand around the holidays than any other cut, and it's more expensive than any other cut. Tenderloin is called lomo, and it doesn't even come near the status that I have round or Paquito has on most holidays. So butcher shops stock up on it as holiday time approaches because everyone and their brother is going to come try to buy one. Are they daft in South America? No, man. They just have a great recipe and a great tradition surrounding this cut. South Americans eat more beef than Americans per capita, and have an incredibly strong enthusiasm for their beef culture. We got my man Chris O'Brien in Uruguay right now. Chris O'Brien, he took a year off of work as a butcher in the States and is doing stints in different butcher shops around the world. First he was in Japan, then he was in Australia, where he told me he was very impressed with the robust butcher culture he witnessed there. Then he was in Argentina, and now Uruguay. Everyone should follow this dude on Instagram. His handle is at chris.o, that's C-H-R-I-S period O-H, chris.o. Chris and I first started corresponding because of our mutual interest in another popular South American cut known, known in the States as elephant ear, rose meat, or wiggle meat or cutaneous trunk eye, this would be the matambre cut. Matambre is the Argentine name 
for this piece of meat from the flank. The word matambre translates to to kill hunger. That's what matambre means, to kill hunger. And it is aptly named because Argentine folks create a food bomb from this thing that will feed a family of five for a whole week. They season it and stuff this cut with veggies and hard-boiled eggs. Then they roll it all up, tie it with string, and either slow roast it or braise it, sometimes in water, sometimes in milk. They do this you know, low and slow for a certain amount of time. Every region and subregion has its own variance. Every family does it its own way. It may sound strange to American eaters, but once you get used to this idea, the idea of this matambre cut, your mind will be blown at how brilliant it is. Here's a cut, matambre, cutaneous trunk eye, that has little to no value in the United States. I can't stress that enough. It is barely noticed. It only goes into the grind. It turns into burger in the United States. And yet, in Argentina, it flies off the shelf. You go into a butcher shop in Argentina and ask for matambre, and they might not have it because everyone you know and all your neighbors are trying to buy a matambre from them also. People are fucking stoked about it, and rightly so. Chris O'Brien shared with me some great recipes for matambre that he learned from hanging out in butcher shops in Argentina. I'll share those in another episode. But let's get back to the potato, the eye of round, because we're talking about holiday roasts here. So here's what Chris has to say about potato. This is from an email he sent me. The two most popular dishes I've heard of are vitel tone, also known as the Italian vitello tonato. It's piquetto boiled in water with herbs and spices, then left to cool in its own juices. The sauce is a homemade mayonnaise, basically with lots of lemon, anchovy, and capers, sometimes made with tuna. The piquetto is sliced and covered in the tonata sauce and chilled for hours, then served. It's a classic Italian veal dish, but the Argentines use it probably because they're most commonly using vacuña, or year-old beef. The most common use of piquetto, though, is slicing it, stuffing it, rolling it, and tying it, then braising it. Basically a bracciole. All right, so yeah, Chris O'Brien, at Chris.oh on Instagram. You got to follow this guy. So apparently at most holidays in Argentina, the asado or the grilled meats still provide the main course for the meal. Piqueto prepared as vitel tone would be served as a decadent appetizer. And as with every dish, each region will have their own variants in how they like to prepare it. So as I'm thinking about this dish that Chris O'Brien's telling me about, I contacted my friend Pablo and asked him, about the dish Vitel Tone. Now, he, Pablo and his wife are from Argentina. They live in the States now, but they're people I go to when I have questions about Argentine cooking. I asked them why it's so similar to the Italian Vitello Tonato, which is made with veal, and like a tuna mayonnaise. He explained to me, they explained to me, that central Argentina is an area of predominantly northern Italian descent, Piedmontese descent, which is the Piedmont region of of northern Italy. So there are a lot of similar foods, similar dishes that you see people preparing in Argentina that stem from the northern Italian uh, culinary traditions. Another dish uh, that they do a lot, very popular in Argentina, is called Pana Cuada, which is like a fondue-like hot dip. Pablo and his wife were gracious enough to share a few recipes for the Vitel Tone for the Eye Round dish, which I will post on the Meat Block Facebook group. Um, I'll, I'll post a couple of those so you guys can check them out, get a better idea of what I'm talking about here. 
I hope this has been interesting to you. This kind of stuff is so fascinating to me, so mind-blowing. I absolutely love it. I would love to have an Argentine friend that lived near me that could cook this stuff for me. And rounding off the show, here's David. Here we are at the tail end of the holiday gauntlet for the meat service industry. Most of us are ass deep in standing rib roasts, hams, turkeys, and concerningly lean briskets. I feel as if I was mostly turned off to those foods during the holidays because of my involvement with them. If by chance someone's holiday spread featured anything unusual, say quail, short ribs, pork back ribs, hog maw, etc., I'd be enthusiastically in for breaking tradition. That's nice to see different proteins on, on the table. Um, over the years, I've become aware of a few seasonal delicacies from around the globe that I that, you know, really rejuvenated my excitement um, for holiday protein dishes. And they've also really provided me with some interesting things to bring to a friend's potluck. While I may be accused of cultural appropriation here, I promise that I take no credit for any of these recipes, and um, we'll post some links to some, some really great versions of them, and maybe even some restaurants that serve them. The first of these recipes I became aware of many years ago was a Sicilian restaurant that I worked in. Uh, the sous chef, let's call him Big A, had a dish that he added to our Christmas slash New Year's brunch menu. It was cotechino and lentils, a dish with a cooked sausage served over a bed of lentils, cooked in a super gelatinous broth and seasoned heavily. It was hearty and perfect for fixing your brain and body after a long New Year's Eve hootening. Cotechino gets its name from the word cotica, which means rind, because the sausage mix contains minced and finely diced and blanched pork skin. You blanch the sausage and serve it over copious amount of lentils. The traditional belief, according to a former customer of mine, Rosaria, who was from Florence, uh, was that lentils bring good fortune for the coming year economically um, because they sort of look like a big pile of coins, historically. I've usually seen um, this particular sausage stuffed inside a bung, a beef bung, uh, however, I have another method that was a little easier to do because these materials were um, more easily found in the home or, or restaurant or butcher shop kitchen. Please, Italians, uh, forgive me if this is blasphemous, blasphemous but it's, it's a great method um, for those of us that don't have access to beef bun. Basically, you're making a torsion um, out of sausage, which is almost, it's kind of like a cylindrical log that's been torqued down in the style of um, almost like a Tootsie Roll or, or a piece of candy, if you can imagine that sort of wrapping. Basically, you season your pork trim. Uh, you want a, a, a nice coarse grind on it. Um, and a recipe for this particular seasoning will be posted on our Facebook group uh, by the time this comes out for you to check out. You lay out a, a double layer of saran wrap. Um, I suggest doing a square, maybe 14 to 18 inches, just so you have plenty of room to, to work. You want to lay out your seasoned sausage block in a hand-formed cylinder on the plastic, lengthwise left to right, uh, on the side of the plastic nearest to you. You then roll the meat up in the plastic wrap, almost as if you were making a sushi roll. There's lots of videos of this technique on YouTube. It's called making a torsion shank muscles without cutting the skin you kind of stick your knife down into it and skin around you then roll the skin back like a sock exposing the full shank saw the shank off or joint it at the joint where it meets the foot you then roll the skin back up and stuff it with your sausage mix you then sew or truss the open end with the twine from there you boil the whole thing until it's fully cooked and tender You'll end up slicing it to serve, but I really prefer to present the whole stuffed trotter with the foot on uh, over the lentils for the full effect. 
This technique was taught to me by Hamsaw Joe, the juice pig, a skilled meat cutter from Maine, who now lives down in barbecue country in the Carolinas. I highly suggest trying either of these dishes for your family because not only are they both very different, um, but they're a lot of fun to prepare. And it might kind of rejuvenate your enthusiasm for holiday protein dishes. The other great part about these dishes is it allows you to move some other product that would normally kind of sit back on your racks during this season. You know, we're generally just moving hams, turkeys, rib roasts, and whatnot. Um, these other presentations look great in the case, and they're definitely a conversation started with customers. That's a great way to, again, move some of the product that will generally sit uh, or need to be frozen until after the holiday. So go ahead and give these ones a try. Um, and let us know if you end up using them in your case or just for your family. And happy holidays. If we make it through December every- All right, meatheads, that's going to do it for our Winter is Trying to Kill Us episode. And the way I fight against the Earth and the darkest, longest night of the year is by cutting down a tree and bringing it into my house and watching it slowly die that's my fuck you earth i win and if you enjoyed this episode of the meat block i would love to hear from you and if you want to get a hold of us the best way to do that is email at the meat block podcast at gmail.com tweet us at the meat block pod or instagram at the meat block if you want to get a hold of let's say david he is at a farm butcher on instagram ryan is at gather and break on instagram and i am at american butcher on instagram and facebook we got a bunch of exciting stuff we're working on for future episodes so if you like this show or if you know someone else who may like this show please tag us on social media by using the hashtag the meat block or tagging us directly by using at the meat block on Instagram or inviting your friends and family to join our Facebook group where we are having great conversations happening daily. And I want that page and that group to be a place where no one has to feel embarrassed for, for posting something where people could ask for advice and there's no showboating, even though it's much fun as it is. And if you want to really, really help us out, the best way to do that is open up the Apple Podcast app, type in the meat block, leave five stars, leave a comment, please. It helps with the algorithm and get more people to find the show. Just like Bloom 55, SPSS 512, and Strix Specialty Meats, and Spagey Rick. I think S P A G Y R I C. I want to thank all those people for leaving five stars and a comment. And until next time, keep your knives sharp and live in the margin.